looking forward to meeting you all week. Wait a minute. I'm not able to meet you. We're in a pandemic. We're in Zoom. Okay. I'm looking forward to seeing you all week. No, wait a minute. We've all got our cameras off. I'm not really seeing you. I'm, I'm, I'm seeing your pictures in, in Zoom. And um, I'm hoping desperately that you'll turn on your microphones once in a while. And isn't this kind of like an average Zoom class a lot of the time? Here's me trying to make you laugh a little bit. Um, I'm here this afternoon to talk a bit about cameras and Zoom. So although I'm trying to make you laugh a little bit at the beginning of our session, it sounds a bit true. It rings a bit true, doesn't it? We are in unchartered times where we are teaching in ways the last 16 months or so uh, using Zoom and social norms within a lot of our Zoom classes, particularly if we are focusing on lecture method in synchronous Zoom classes, is the instructor is talking and teaching and a lot of the Zoom cameras are off. And Myself, like many other instructors, I haven't quite completely known how to manage this. So I started looking into it and I started trying out different techniques. And I was keen to share some ideas with you at the Online Teaching Institute. Some of the questions that have come up around this topic are how we can foster communication, trust, and meaningful learning conversations when the doors to our Zoom windows are closed. Uh, other questions include, is it appropriate to be multitasking while listening to a lecture or um, participating in a Zoom class? What happens or how is our learning impacted as a result? Another question that's being asked more recently is having the camera on or off a matter of respect or professional, professionalism or civility. Or is it just part of the social norms of this new way of teaching and learning? So all of these questions are very new and a lot of them um, didn't become quite so pressing until the pandemic came along. So <clears throat> let's try out something a little bit differently. Let's try out a different start than we had at the beginning where I was making a little bit of a joke about having all of our windows closed. What I'd like you to do is I'd like you to look around your teaching and learning environment at the moment. I'd like you to look around your desk or your dining room table or wherever you happen to be participating from. And I'd like you to select an object from your environment that says something about who you are or where you are at this moment. So I'm gonna give you an example to buy you a little bit of time. Um, I am looking at remote work. So if I take my camera and focus it on remote work, a book I'm reading is The Remote Work Revolution. Okay, so that's something I'm exploring in this particular moment in time. Something else that uh, you might not know about me um, that I could show you is I love paper notebooks. So I always have at least a few paper notebooks that are in and around my desk where I'm putting ideas and thoughts and to-do lists. So in 10 seconds time, I'm going to ask each of you to momentarily turn on your camera. So in 10 seconds time, I'm going to ask you to turn on your cameras and hold up your object. You, you yourself do not need to be appearing on the camera, just the object you selected from where you happen to be working. So um, I'll show my notebook again, as David has asked. And all right, here we go. In five seconds, please show an object from your surrounding environment that shows something about who you are and where you are right now. Now, if you wanna take a peek at what everyone else is holding up, you can do that. But the focus is not on our faces, it's on our objects. Take a moment, have a look. Cool, I'm seeing gardens, I'm seeing lunches, I'm seeing kitty cats. Plants, cool. Thank you so much. If you'd like, you can turn your cameras off again. It's totally up to you. 
So what I've done with this activity in classes in the past is I might offer an opportunity for students to ask questions of each other about the objects they've held up. Or I might, um, if I know the students quite well, I might call on them to talk a little bit more about the object that they've selected. Um, if I have students who do not have camera access or having bandwidth issues, then I'll ask students to consider putting the, the item in the chat that they have chosen to share with the class, or they can drop a picture in the chat from their smartphone as a way of sharing their object with the rest of the class. Now, I have also worked with instructors to consider how this idea might be adapted if you have an object that relates to the subject matter that you are talking about on a particular day. You might ask students to bring uh, an object or a book or, or some kind of um, um, physical representation of what you're talking about on that particular day. So what are the advantages of synchronous Zoom classes? What are some of the advantages of coming together in a, at the exact same moment in time in Zoom? And, and why do we often choose to have this synchronous time together? I think as we start looking at some of the ideas we can use and some of the reasons behind why doors are often closed in Zoom, it's important for us to consider how we got to the idea of hosting a synchronous Zoom class. Synchronous learning um, means opportunities for teaching and learning that involve real-time collaboration. So it's an opportunity for us to engage with the content in the exact same moment with our students and have our students learn in the same moment from each other. This is one of the best ways to leverage some of the things that worked really well in the physical classroom in an online environment. And how do we do that when the doors are closed in Zoom or the windows are closed in Zoom? We'll talk about that in just a moment. Another important reason for having a synchronous learning opportunity in your course is social isolation. This past year in particular has been a time where loneliness and social isolation is um, a pretty common part of the learning uh, experience. And thank you. I will post these slides for you afterwards. I, I promise you'll have an opportunity to, to have these in hand. Um, it will be an opportunity for you to get to know the students in the class and for the students to know each other in the class more completely than they would in an asynchronous class. So if you are working on a class that would benefit from, from dialogue, from learning experiences that involves communication, that involves professionalism, this social interaction can be an important part of the learning experience. Building a sense of community means that we help each other in the learning process and help each other take our learning further than we might if we were taking it alone in an asynchronous teaching and learning experience. The other important reason for synchronous learning means that students can get feedback and we can get feedback from students. So one of the risks with a completely asynchronous course is it can be out of sight, out of mind. Unless the student is logged into eClass, uh, students um, can miss out on opportunities to pace out the course in regularly scheduled intervals that can be afforded when synchronous learning opportunities are scheduled through synchronous classes. So students can get feedback from the instructor, whether that's in the form of working through problems, um, a lecture, a discussion, some feedback on a, a performance, if it's a performance-based course, uh, or a skill, if there are skills the students are learning. Um, and then the students, can also get feedback from the instructor. I think there's one more bullet point there. Okay. And then the, ins the instructor can also find out how the students are doing in the course. One of the things I first I discovered when I first started teaching completely asynchronously years ago was I wondered how the students were doing in the course. Um, so synchronous learning opportunities meant that I could 
um, connect with my students and ask them questions, even if it was in the form of a poll or office hours about how they were doing in the course with the material, with projects, in interacting with each other, and in keeping up with the course material. So these are important reasons why I think having some synchronous learning opportunities can really improve a course. So that leads us to the big question. Why don't folks turn on their cameras? And what I'd like you to do is open up the chat and add in one idea per chat bubble about why you think folks don't open their windows. What do you think? They're in their PJs, possibly. Let's let that roll for a moment. They don't have to. Privacy. They don't want to be looked at. My hair is a mess. Bandwidth issues, absolutely. Students may not feel comfortable showing their home or study environment. They're not comfortable on camera. There's other people in the environment. Occasional nose picks. <laughs> Here's a little um, graphic that I thought was interesting. If you wanna take a peek at it and see if any of these ideas resonate with you. The next thing I did as someone with academic training and an academic background is go out into the academic literature and say, okay, who's studying this and what do we know? So there aren't a lot of published uh, articles on this, as you might well imagine, because this issue is still fairly new, but there are a few, and I'm going to provide you not only with the slides, but I'm gonna provide you with a folder with the literature that I found so far. And a few of the gray literature from, from articles like higher education and, and some of the debate around this topic. So you can expect to find this on our, through our website as well. But the, a couple of the, the key articles here are going to help me tell you what the literature and the research so far tells us about why students aren't turning on their cameras. The first reason that students commonly do not turn on their cameras are related to issues around appearance. Students report that they don't like the way they look. Um, maybe it is a physical appearance concern, or maybe, as one of you mentioned, the student isn't prepared to be on camera. So the student didn't shower, didn't do makeup, isn't dressed, and just isn't prepared for other people to see them. Another common concern that one of you mentioned is feeling shy. Um, this feeling like everyone is looking at you when you're in Zoom was something that came up again and again in the available literature on this topic. So this feeling that everyone is looking at you is opposed in the literature to when we were in a classroom, all of us were facing forward. So we were looking at the back of folks' heads, right? We weren't sitting and looking at each other. This experience is reported in the literature to cause feelings of concern about how others perceive us, how we look, and making us look self-conscious. This might also include the fact that some folks are really close to their cameras and some people are really far from their cameras. So we might feel like we are physically closer or further than we would normally be if we were sitting in a classroom and we were practicing consciously or unconsciously the social distancing norms that we would have if we were in face-to-face -face learning. And as we mentioned earlier in the session, group norms or social norms eventually play out such that if everyone else is turning off their camera, well, I'm going to turn my camera off too. The um, study that focused the most on this particular idea was a German study called Generation Invisible. And these authors in their 2020 study argued that current students have a preference for anonymity online. 
And so that leads them to want to turn off their cameras and create group or social norms where the cameras are off. Practical concerns, one of you mentioned a weak internet connection. Well, absolutely, if you don't have the bandwidth, then it really makes it hard to come in and participate with your camera on. Um, so that is a very, very practical concern. One of you also mentioned the desire to maintain privacy or not have other people see what's behind your camera. If you're working with an older camera, an older computer, you may not have the option for putting up a background. Um, and also, if you don't have a dedicated workspace, then you are going to have other parts of your home or your living space that you may not want other people to see. You, one of you mentioned having uh, family members or, or people walking behind your screens, and that could make you uncomfortable. I certainly have had an experience with this when the pandemic first um, broke out and my husband was working in, we have a, a dedicated home office space at the, at, on the first floor of our home and I was working upstairs in a hallway. Our hallway was right next to the, um, I had set up a table with my computer and um, brought a few things home from the office like you likely did. And my computer table uh, upstairs in our hallway was right next to the laundry basket. Well, for the longest time, I lived in fear that a, a, one piece of laundry from my husband would come flying across my screen in the middle of a Zoom meeting. So uh, I had to move that laundry basket pretty quick because um, meeting with, for example, the vice provost and having a piece of laundry come flying across my screen would have been a little bit embarrassing. So. <clears throat> A desire to maintain privacy and maintain that separate home space or study space from uh, the public Zoom space is, is definitely one of the reasons cited in these studies for why students may choose to turn their cameras off. Now, another very common reason is that we don't want to be seen or see others doing non-class related tasks. What kinds of non-class related tasks do you think folks are doing when they are in Zoom meetings or in Zoom classes? If you have an idea, pop it in the chat. Here's a moment to share. What do you think most commonly, can you predict what was in the literature, the most common non-class related activities were? Shopping, Facebook, texting, eating lunch, browsing Instagram, sleeping. All right, great ideas from our audience. So the literature found when they asked students that they were commonly lying in bed, they didn't want to be seen walking away from the camera to do something like go to the washroom or put on a sweater, correcting or uh, addressing a correcting a child or addressing a family member, um, folding laundry or doing other household tasks, going to the washroom as I mentioned, answering email, browsing other websites checking social media, or making dinner. Other reasons that I found cited in the literature, some of which I, I can relate to myself, uh, are Zoom fatigue. We know that being in, all, uh, in Zoom all day long can be cognitively, uh, mentally very taxing. And so uh, more taxing than many of us realized. Uh, initially when we started working on the pandemic. I know when the pandemic first broke out, I was spending eight hours a day meeting with instructors in Zoom calls and I had nothing left at the end of the day, I was exhausted. And if you spend long stretches in Zoom, you may also find the same, why am I so tired? I've just been in Zoom all day. It is shown to be quite cognitively taxing. And if you, if, you, if you Google or take a look at Zoom fatigue, you can find out more about it is a thing. It is a real experience. Um, so some of your students, if they're taking multiple classes, may be experiencing Zoom 
fatigue to some greater or lesser degree. One of you mentioned though as well that there are no real consequences to not turning on our cameras. Well, while we could um, talk to students after class or catch them at the break, uh, we're often not afforded some of the same classroom management uh, opportunities in Zoom when, when cameras are off. That said, many students relating back to our um, discussion about appearance and being shy, many students are very concerned about being recorded in Zoom. Um, so they may turn off their cameras for that reason as well. More recently, discussions within the literature um, and online have been about mental health concerns. Depression, anxiety are mentioned the most commonly as COVID-19 has certainly increased student anxiety and depression levels we're finding. So if students are a vulnerable population for developing mental health disorders during the pandemic, um, which the most common, oh, which the most recent literature, excuse me, has been finding, um, then turning on cameras can compound that experience of anxiety for some. Or if they are not sleeping, for example, then they may be lying in bed or they may not want to appear on, camp on camera. It all starts to become interwoven into several reasons why one might not be motivated uh, to turn on a camera, even if the instructor is, is asking um, for this kind of participation in class. So I think in reflecting on these reasons from the literature, one of the first things that I want to, to tell you as an, as an educator is that this is more complex than I had ever imagined it to be. Um, I think what I've heard from instructors is um, it's quite natural to assume that if the cameras are off, it might not always be for the the it might not always be for a positive reason, or it, it's easy to assume the worst, that students are go right to online shopping and doing other things and not paying attention. But the problem is really quite complex. And mentioning something from the presentation that Anita and, and Graham provided just before this session, I think we have to assume on some level that our students are doing the best they can where they are at that particular moment. And whether we were in class physically or whether we're online, there are always going to be some students that participate um, and are engaged more fully and actively than others. I don't, I don't think that changes in, in this environment. This poses the question, of what are our options as instructors. If this is the complex reality of teaching in Zoom with a camera synchronously, what, what are our options? What can we do? So let's look at a couple of different options. Um, you may find that some of these suggestions resonate with you more than others based on your teaching style and your, your comfort level with teaching online. It may, uh, some ideas may resonate with you more than others, depending on the type of course you're teaching and the course material you're teaching. Or you might find that uh, the right combination of strategies does help to engage you with your students and with your students with each other more often. So, so let's see what other possible tools we can put in your toolkit. So coming back to the question of, are cameras related to respect and civility? Well, they are on a very, very basic level when we talk about setting up your course and the syllabus or first class discussions about Zoom etiquette and what you expect from your students in terms of punctuality, distractions, um, when to mute and unmute, um, how to handle one student speaking on top of the other, um, and whether or not students come to class prepared. So a first line of action as an instructor can be to consider what are some of the baseline most important considerations for Zoom etiquette 
if, when doing synchronous Zoom classes. You're welcome to use um, uh, an infographic like this, um, or you're welcome to ask your students to submit what they think are the key baseline civility and professionalism um, ideas for you for a Zoom synchronous class and then compile them into uh, some sort of, of list or infographic like this as the rules of engagement for, for your synchronous online classes. That is definitely where I would start in addressing some of the, the respect, professionalism and civility issues that can, that can occur in Zoom. Um, you can also consider sharing these ideas with other colleagues because I can tell you that it, it is confusing for students when every time they take a new course, there are different rules for engagement in these matters. So uh, creating a party line within a particular program, department, uh, helps the students to understand um, and shift between courses more easily. Then I don't have to remember, I need to behave this way in Graham's course, this way in Anita's course, and this way in Cassette's course. An important question for you to consider when you're planning your synchronous online course uh, classes is what kinds of learning can be camera optional. So for example, if you are listening to a lecture, then really it's not 100% necessary for students to have their cameras on. Uh, if you want students to providing feedback on problems, having discussions, then in this instance, you may ask students to turn cameras on. Depending on the size of your class, you may choose to send students into breakout rooms, of course. You may consider using polling options. But I'd like you to think about, do you need to have your students have their cameras on for the entire synchronous class? I would ask you to think carefully. And of course, a developer at CTL would be a good person to contact to think this through with if you're struggling. What parts of it, your synchronous online class could have camera off and could have camera on to optimize the teaching and learning? Could there be periods, short periods, where the camera is on and for what purpose? So this is an important question to consider um, because students may not have the bandwidth, because students may not... Um, have the Zoom fatigue, uh, the Zoom strength to be on for an hour and a half. So are there particular moments when you can optimize getting the students to turn their camera on and participate? Key learning moments. Lisa Stein mentioned having little learning breaks in a lecture where she stopped and asked students a question. If students are having a five minute learning um, opportunity, a learning break where they do a problem, they answer a question, they do a poll, could that be a moment where they turn on their camera for one minute and then we turn them off again and resume lecture, for instance. Another important idea in creating strong Zoom synchronous relationships with your students is to communicate with your students. Um, I find this works best anonymously, uh, but again, it depends on the size of your class. Ask your students, what would make you more comfortable turning on your camera? So is there something that we can do in the course to remove a barrier? Because I'd like you to think about the idea, if the barrier doesn't reside with the student, if the barrier resides with the course, how can I, as an instructor, take down a barrier to help the students turn off, turn off the camera? So what barrier can I remove that would make you more comfortable turning off, turning on your camera, excuse me? So if the barrier lies within the course, within the instruction, how can I take down that barrier so you feel more comfortable turning on your camera? Um, it can help to improve participation using uh, synchronous Zoom classes and a camera to ask your students this question. I often take the answers to these questions and then have a, a brief discussion with the students um, about their answers and then we carry on and I have found that some students turn their cameras on more frequently as a result. 
So I have modeled at the beginning of the session how you can get students who feel very shy about being on camera, about having their appearance on camera, to make the focus of turning on the camera less about the person and more about what's the answer to your to a question. Um, it, you can have them jot down an answer on paper, draw a picture. Um, and I'm going to show one more strategy related to that next slide, Graham. Um, or use uh, their hand to communicate and give feedback about the course. So this is one of my favorite quotes about communicating in class from Jimmy Carter. But you can ask students to turn on their cameras periodically for the purposes of giving you a fist to five check. And uh, depending on the course, you may find this, this works quite well. If uh, the, the student completely understands, you may just ask them to put up their fist. Four, three, two, I need more help or none at all. And then the focus becomes the fist. Other students will get creative and they will just show their hand on camera. But I find at the very least, we get a little bit of a, a humor break and, and trying this out. I have encountered instructors in working at the Center for Teaching and Learning who have gotten creative. And one way to build community is by asking students to um, participate in different types of theme days. So this is a shot from a class where um, that particular Zoom day was everyone wear a hat. And although they only turned their cameras on to show uh, what their hat was that they wore to participate in class that day, um, it was a moment of humor. It was a moment of connection. It was a moment where we got to see uh, each other in Zoom and uh, before we carried on with class. So you might do this as a warm up, you might do this as a break, but I have seen theme days related to the color you wear, to um, related to an item of clothing. Um, I have seen um, wear sunglasses day. Um, yes, an instructor has really run with it that I have had a consult with who said, okay, if you're wearing your pajamas anyway, let's have pajama day. Now, this is, of course, up to you in terms of your comfort with this idea, but it has been a way that instructors have connected with their students by having them um, wear a scarf, wear, a, wear something. Um, or do something or share a picture as a way of not focusing so much on um, someone's appearance, but uh, upon what they bring to class. And often it's really good for a laugh. So I wanted to make sure that we had some time um, to talk about what you've tried um, to get students to be more comfortable about turning on their cameras in class. I myself in sessions have used a combination of strategies just to sum up while you're thinking about some of the things you've tried. I have had particular moments in my synchronous um, online classes where I've had camera optional and, and asked students to turn on their cameras. I have um, set some ground rules for participation that have made students more comfortable turning on their camera with a Zoom infographic about etiquette and baseline etiquette for the class. I have um, also had um, moments like today where I've asked students to bring certain things to class um, or I've asked students, um, even sometimes in advance of class, to volunteer to be on camera next class. So they knew that maybe, you know, next time you come to class and you're, you're ready and dressed and rehearsed to be on camera. But I'm keen now to find out what you've tried. So if you wouldn't mind turning on your camera to share an idea 
or putting it in the chat. If you've got an idea you'd like to share on camera, please raise your hand using the emoticon button. An instructor has told us that uh, they've sent messages to students setting the ground rules before the course even started. Showing pets works really well, even it even gets people without pets putting their cameras on to say how cute a pet is. Oh, someone had a Halloween costumes day. Another suggestion is addressing individuals as part of regular Q&A dialogue and confirming that they need to respond with the camera on or the camera off. A distinction I wish to make here is the difference between cold calling and warm calling. We, it's come up. So a cold call would be for me to uh, say, Graham, what do you think about that? And ask Graham to respond, whether he turns on the camera or not. A warm call is more like what David had suggested, where the students are given the questions either in advance or uh, another suggestion is to private chat a student or a group of students who are in a breakout room and ask them to be ready to talk to the whole group or even to turn their camera on to address the whole class with a response. This warm calling response tends to work better in a synchronous online Zoom environment because the students know the question in advance, they have time to prepare, they have time to rehearse, um, and they know what's coming. Okay. Um, as David alluded to earlier, it this strategy tends to work better in, in smaller classes where the instructor or the instructor and the TA are able to keep track. The challenge with assigning participation is um, we need to be clear about what is being asked the students to, to do in that participation. If you're going to give students participation marks simply for turning on the camera, um, then that is not necessarily a valuable coming back to something that Bob Duke was saying, that's not necessarily a valuable um, indication of their comprehension of the information or, or their learning in the course, right? Um, we, it's best not to give students uh, a participation check mark in our spreadsheet if the students are simply showing up, right? I think that we're looking for um, participation in terms of what is the contribution to the class. So <clears throat> guidelines for what that participation entails is really important. So if you are going to use participation marks, it's important for you to lay out for the students your expectations for participation and give some clear examples of what that participation might entail, right? So defining what forms of participation are going to get the check mark in the spreadsheet or the participation points. Is it for um, is it for asking a question? Is it for providing an explanation? Is it for sharing a response to a problem that was posed in class? Um, is it for explaining how you worked through a mathematical problem? Is it um, for representing your team who just did a, a, a case study in a breakout room and now you're explaining your, your group's process and final response to the rest of the class? So <clears throat> um, one of you has mentioned um, uh, rubrics in the chat now uh, as a way to uh, grade this. And it, um, so I, I agree, rubrics can also often be really helpful in this regard. It does become problematic when you have lots and lots of students. Um, and then the 5%, I think is the other part of that question. So, <clears throat> I think that how much you assign 
to students' participation in a synchronous Zoom class is going to depend on what the learning outcomes are for the course. So in a lab-based online synchronous course, or in a skills-based course, or in a case study-based course, I would imagine that that participation mark could be higher than 5%. If the students have to spend a good part of the Zoom class participating in activities, then that participation mark is likely going to be higher. If for me, 5% speaks to something like um, what our colleague Lisa Stein was talking about earlier. Lisa was providing a lecture and then every 10 or 15 minutes, she might have a lecture break where she poses a question, a problem, something for the students to do, solve, comment on. And in that instance, students work through something and then they share a response on uh, and if they if they do so, then they might get a participation mark for that. Um, so. The percentage, I think, depends on the purpose of the course and the the me and how much participating in the course is ultimately tied to learning in the course. So another couple of comments I just want to share with everyone. Participation expectations can align with the soft skill learning outcomes. Yes, absolutely. Thank you for mentioning uh, that, Anita. Um, making sure that if you do have a uh, soft skill uh, learning outcomes in your course, how can you match that with the, the guidelines, the expectations that you give your students for how to participate in a Zoom class? And, and we've also had the reminder from another colleague that students who do talk a lot um, for whatever reason, some students are more comfortable than others. It is important to reinforce, it's not just the quantity, it's the quality of what you have to share in a single class. I could go on and on and with my camera on folks, but it's time to wrap up the Online Teaching Institute. So I wanna say a very warm thank you for participating in this session today with me and exploring uh, this question of Zoom cameras and synchronous online teaching.